Martin Luther King. In honor of Martin Luther King, I will read why we can't wait. Freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. It's funny how Martin Luther King, he wrote as a Christian conservative. He was a Republican. And he was writing on civil disobedience and when we should stand up for unjust laws being made by our government. I hope he said, okay, so I have to back up a little bit in his book, um, a letter, he wrote this letter from the Birmingham jail. I hope, sir, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. You express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break laws. This is certainly a legitimate concern since we so diligently urge people to obey the Supreme Court decision of 1954 outlawing segregation in public schools. At first glance, it may seem rather paradoxically for us consciously to break laws. One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust laws. I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. Now, what is the difference between the two? How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? Well, a just law is a man-made code that requires... No, a just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with a moral law. To put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal law and natural law. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. All segregation statutes are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives a segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. Segregation, to use the terminology of the Jewish philosopher Martin Berber substitutes an I-it relationship for an I-thou relationship and ends up regulating persons to the status of things. Hence, segregation is not only politically, economically, and sociologically unsound, it is morally wrong and sinful. Paul Tillich has said that sin is separation. Is it not segregation an existential expression of man's tragic separation, his uh, awful estrangement, his terrible sinfulness? 
Thus it is that I can urge men to obey the 1954 decision of the Supreme Court, for it is morally right. And I can urge them to disobey segregation ordinances, for they are morally wrong. Let us consider a more concrete example of just and unjust laws. An unjust law is a code that a numerical or power majority group compels a minority group to obey, but does not make binding on itself. This is different, the difference be made legal. By the same token, a just law is a code that is that a majority compels a minority to follow and that is willing to follow itself. This is a sameness made legal. Let me give another explanation. A law is unjust if it is inflicted on a minority that as a result of being denied the right to vote had no part in enacting or devising the law. Who can say that the legislature of Alabama which set up the state segregation laws was democratically elected. Throughout Alabama, all sorts of devious methods are used to prevent Negroes from becoming registered voters. And there are some counties in which even enough, even though Negroes constitute a majority of the population, not a single Negro is registered. Can any law enacted under such circumstances be considered democratically structured? Sometimes a law is just on its face and unjust in its application. For instance, I have been arrested on a charge of parading without a permit. Now there is nothing wrong in having an ordinance which requires a permit for a parade, but such ordinance becomes unjust when it is used to maintain segregation, to deny citizens the First Amendment privilege of peaceful assembly and protest. I hope you are able to see the distinction I am trying to point out. In no sense do I advocate evading or defying the law as would the rabid segregationist. That would lead to anarchy. One who breaks an unjust law must, be so, do, must do so openly, lovingly, and with the willingness to accept the penalty. I submit that an individual who breaks a law that con conscience tells him is unjust, who, will, who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over the injustice, is in reality expressing the highest respect for law. Of course, there is nothing new about the kind of civil disobedience. It was evidenced sublimely in the refusal of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to obey the laws of Nebuchadnezzar on the grounds that a higher moral law was at stake. It was practiced superbly by the early Christians who were willing to face hungry lions and the excruciating pain of chopping blocks rather than submit to certain unjust laws of the Roman Empire. To a degree, academic freedom is a reality today because Socrates practiced civil disobedience. In our own nation, the Boston Tea Party presented a massive act of civil disobedience. 
And we should never forget that everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal. And everything the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was illegal. It was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. Even so, I am sure that had I lived in Germany at the time, I would have aided and comforted my Jewish brothers. If today I lived in a communist country like China, where certain principles dear to the Christian faith are suppressed, I would openly advocate disobeying the country's anti-religious laws. I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderates. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride towards freedom is not the white citizen's concealer or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly say, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with you in the methods of direct action, who paternalistically believe he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mystical concept of time, who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season, shallow understanding from people of goodwill, is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. I had hoped that the white moderate would understand that law and order exist, exist for the purpose of establishing justice and that when they fail in this purpose, they become the dangerously structured dams that block the flow of social progress. I had hoped that the white moderate would understand that the present tension in the South is a necessary phase of the transition from an obnoxious negative peace in which the Negro passively accepted his unjust plight to a substantive and positive peace in which all men will respect the dignity and, worthy and worth of human personality. Actually, we who engage in nonviolent direct action are not the creators of tension. We merely bring to the surface the hidden tension that is already alive. We bring it out in the open where it can be seen and dealt with, like a boil that can never be cured so long as it is covered up, but must be opened with all its ugliness to the natural medicine of air and light. Injustice must be exposed with all the tension its exposure creates to the light of human conscience and the air of national opinion before it can be cured. In your statement, you assert that our actions, even though peaceful, must be condemned because they per precipitate violence but is this a logical assertion isn't this like condemning a robbed man because his possession of money precipitated the evil act of robbery isn't this like 
condemning Socrates because his unswerving commitment to truth and his philosophical inquiries precipi precipitated the act by the misguided populace in which they made him drink hemlock? Isn't this like condemning Jesus because his unique God conscience and never ceasing devotion to God well precipitated the evil act of crucifixion? We must come to see that as the federal government <coughs> has consistently affirmed it is wrong to urge an individual to seize his effort to gain his basic constitutional rights because the quest may precipitate violence. Society must protect the robbed and punish the robber. I had also hoped that the white moderates would reject the myth concerning time in relation to the struggle for freedom. I have just received a letter from a white brother in Texas. He writes, all Christians know that the colored people will receive equal rights eventually, but it is possible that you are too great, you are in too great a religious hurry. It has taken Christianity almost 2,000 years to accomplish what it has. The teachings of Christ take time to come to earth. Such an attitude stems from a tragic misconception of time from the strangely irrational notion that there is something in the very flow of time that will inevitably cure all ills. Actually, time itself is neutral. It can be used either destructively or constructively. More and more I feel that the people of ill will have used time much more effectively than the people of good will. We will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the pe bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. Human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. In, it comes through the tireless efforts of men willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the force of social stagnation. We must use time creatively in the knowledge that the time is always ripe to do right. Now is the time to make real the promise of democracy and transform our pending national elegy into a creative psalm of brotherhood. Now is the time to lift our national policy from the quicksand of racial injustice to the solid rock of human dignity. You speak of, acti of our activity and bring, bring him as extreme. At first I was rather disappointed that fellow clergymen would see my nonviolent efforts as those of an extremist. I began thinking about the fact that I stand in the middle of two opposing forces in the Negro community. I began thinking about the fact that I stand in the middle of two opposing forces in the Negro community. One is a force of complacency made up in the part of Negroes who, as a result of long years of oppression, are so drained of self-respect and a sense of somebodyness that they have adjusted to segregation. And in part of a few middle-class Negroes who, because of a degree of academic and economic security, and because in some ways they profit by segregation, have become insensitive to the problems of the masses. The other force is one of bitterness and hatred, and it comes perilously close to advocating violence. It is expressed in the various black nationalist groups that are springing up across the nation, the largest and best known being Elijah Muhammad Mu Muslim Movement, 
today, it would be the BLM movement in Antifa. Nourished by the Negro's frustration over the continued existence of racial discrimination, this movement is made up of people who have lost faith in America, who have absolutely repudiated Christianity, and who have concluded that the white man is an incorrigible devil. I have tried to stand between these two forces, saying that we need emulate neither the do nothingness the, the, the do nothingness ism of the complacent nor the hatred and despair of the black nationalist for there is more excellent way of love nonviolent protest i am grateful to god that through the influence of the negro church the way of nonviolence became an integral part of our struggle <coughs> If this philosophy had not emerged by now, many streets of the South would, I am convinced, be flowing with blood. And I am further convinced that if our white brothers dismiss as rabble rouser and outside agitators, those of us who employ nonviolent direct action, and if they refuse to support our nonviolent efforts, Millions of Negroes will, out of frustration and despair, seek solace and security in black nationalist ideologies, a development that would inevitably lead to a frightening racial nightmare. Today, 2021, 2022, we are, we have been led to a frightening racial nightmare with this equity in education and this movement for social justice. Oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. The yearning for freedom eventually manifests itself. That is what is, has happened to the American Negro. Something within has reminded him of his birthright of freedom and something was out has reminded him that it can be gained. The United States Negro is moving with a sense of great urgency toward the promised land of racial justice. Let him make prayer pilgrimages to the city hall. Let him go on freedom rides and try to understand why we must do so. Today, we don't need to go on freedom rides because we're all free. We do prayer pilgrimages at City Hall for the unborn babies who die from abortion. If his repressed emotions are not released in nonviolent ways, they will seek expression through violence. This is not a threat but a fact of history. So I have not said to my people, get rid of your discontent. Rather, I have tried to say that this normal and healthy discontent can be channeled into creative outlet of nonviolent direct action. And now this approach is being termed extremism. But though I was initially disappointed at being categorized as an extremist. As I continued to think about the matter, I gradually gained a measure of satisfaction from the label. Was not Jesus an extremist for love? Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Was not Paul an extremist for the Christian gospel? I bear in my body the mark of the Lord Jesus. 
was that Martin Luther an extremist? Here I stand. I can not do otherwise, so help me God. And John Bunyan, I will stay in jail to the end of my days before I make a butchery of my conscience. And Abraham Lincoln, this nation cannot survive half slave and half free. And, Thal and Thomas Jefferson, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of an extremist will we be? Will we be extremists for hate or extremists for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice or for the extension of justice? In that dramatic scene of Calvary's Hill, three men were crucified. We must never forget that all three were crucified for the same crime. The crime of extremism. Two were extremists for immorality, thus fell below the environment. The other, Jesus Christ, was an extremist for love, truth, and goodness, and thereby rose above the environment. Perhaps the South, the nation, and the world are in dire need of creative extremists. I hope that the white moderate would see need. Perhaps I was too optimistic. Perhaps I expected too much. I suppose I should have realized that few members of the oppressor race can understand the deep groans, the deep groans and passionate yearnings of the oppressed race and still fewer have the vision to see that injustice must be rooted out by strong, persistent, and determined action. I am thankful, however, that some of our white brothers in the South have grasped to the meaning of this social revolution and committed themselves to it. They are still all too few in quantity, but they are big in quality. Some such, Ralph McGill, Lillian Smith, Harry Goldman, James McBride, Debs, Ann Braden, and Sarah Patton Boyle have written about this, our struggle in eloquent and prophetic terms. <clears throat> Others have marched with us down nameless streets of the South. They have laughed in filthy roach-infested jails. No, they have languished in filthy roach-infested jails, suffered the abuse and brutality of policemen who view them as dirty nigger lovers, unlike so much, unlike so many of the moderate brothers and sisters, they have recognized the urgency of the moment and sensed the need for powerful action, anti-doers to combat the disease of segregation. Let me take note of my other major disappointment. I have been so greatly disappointed with the white church and its leadership. Of course, there are some notable exceptions. I am not unmindful of the fact that each of you has taken some significant stands on this issue. I commend you, Reverend Stalin, for your Christian stand on this past Sunday in welcoming Negroes to your worship service on a non-segregated basis. I commend the Catholic leaders of this state for integrating Spring Hill College several years ago. But despite these notable exceptions, most honestly reiterate, I must honestly reiterate that I have been disappointed with the church. I do not say this as one of those negative critics who can always find something wrong with the church. I say this as a minister of the gospel who loves the church, who was nurtured in its bosom, who has been sustained by its spiritual blessing. 
and who will remain true to it as long as the cord of life shall lengthen. I felt that the white ministers, priests, and rabbis of the South would be among the strongest allies. Instead, some have been outright opponents, refusing to understand the freedom movement and misrepresenting its leaders. All too many others have been more cautious than courageous and have remained silent behind the NS sizing security of stained glass windows. In spite of my shattered dreams, I came to bring him with the hope that the white religious leadership of this community would see the justice of our cause and with deep moral concern would serve as the channel through which our just grievances would reach the power structure. I have heard numerous religious leaders admonish their worshipers to comply with, de with a desegregation decision because it is the law. But I have longed to hear white ministers declare, follow the decree because integration is morally right because ne the Negro is your brother. In other words, Martin Luther King was condemning the church for allowing themselves to make their worshipers comply with laws that were unjust instead of laws that are just. In the midst of blatant injustice inflicted upon the Negro, I have watched white churchmen stand on the sidelines uh, and, pi and mouth pious irrelevancies and sanctimonious trivial trivial trivialties in the midst of mighty struggle to, ri to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice, I have heard many ministers say, those are social issues with which the gospel has no real concern. And I have watched many churches commit themselves to a completely otherworldly religion which makes a strange unbiblical distinction between body and soul, between, between sacred and secular. And with that, I leave you with Martin Luther King's timeless letter from the Birmingham jail. Perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mother and father at will and drown your sister and brother at whim, when you see the vast majority of 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain your, to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling in her eyes when she, she is told that Fun Town is closed to the colored children and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky. When you take a cross-country drive and find it, necessary to sleep night after night in an uncomfortable corner of your automobile because no motel will accept you when your wife and mother are never given respected title miss when you are forever fighting 
a degenerate, degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. Why we can't wait is ever more needed today than it has ever been. And I think that everyone should buy it now at Amazon. Please click, click on the link below. I will post the link to find this book quickly and swiftly so that you may read it and enjoy the words of Martin Luther King.